From the McCourtney Institute for Democracy on the campus of Penn State University, I'm Michael Berkman. And I'm Jenna Spinelli, and welcome to a special episode of Democracy Works. We're talking about impeachment today. And uh, with us to do that, as we record here on Friday afternoon, September 27th, we have with us Michael Nelson, who is the Hyde Early Career Professor of Political Science here at Penn State and an affiliate faculty member in Penn State Law. So between the two of you, lots of expertise. I can't wait to hear how you frame uh, the issue of impeachment, its relationship to democracy, everything that's transpired over the past couple of days. So without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Michael. Take it away. Yeah, thank you, Jenna. Well, Michael, it's been quite a week. Yes, it has. I figure since we've been talking impeachment all week, we may as well put it on the air. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's how Democracy Works was born, actually. It was, we figured that Chris and I were having so many conversations about democracy, we may as well put it on the air. Yeah. So uh, what I want to do today is talk a little bit about how impeachment works, how it fits into the constitutional separation of powers, and uh, why the Ukraine affair raises important issues about our democracy, and then anything else that comes to mind. Sounds great. Okay, good. So let's get started. Uh, where, where is impeachment in the Constitution? So there are bits and pieces of impeachment all throughout the Constitution. So the framers gave the House of Representatives the ability to impeach a constitutional officer. They gave the Senate the ability to try impeachments. And then they gave the Chief Justice the ability to preside over impeachment trials in the Senate of a president. So they explain the process, but yes. they also laid out the uh, conditions for impeachment, right? Or the, yes. the circumstances that would bring about impeachment. Yes. So they said that impeachment happens only in cases of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Yeah. Just to be specific, that's uh, Article 2, Section 4, right? So Article yes. 2 talks about the executive branch, lays out a bit about his powers, her powers goes into a convoluted discussion about how to choose the executive and then about how to remove him potentially through 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 impeachment. So high crimes, high crimes is not something that we that's not a term we use very often in American jurisprudence. What 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 so be putting on your originalist hat a little bit, which I know you know how to do. What they mean when they talked about a high crime and misdemeanor. So it's interesting because when you when you look at those three things, treason bribery, and high crimes and misdemeanors, one of those things has a definition specifically in the Constitution. So the framers were, were worried about uh, crimes of treason because the, the British were, were using these show trials to, to convict colonists. And so they put a definition for that in the Constitution. They left uh, this definition of high crimes and misdemeanors out, thinking that, well, when it comes to it, they'll figure out what it means. Uh, but they didn't take it from it from out of the blue. They got it from British common law. Right. So high crimes and misdemeanors as a as a phrase came from the British common law. And it was the sort of thing that Parliament used when they were removing crown officials. And it had been used that way for centuries in, in Britain. Yeah. So, I mean, my understanding of high crimes and putting aside the misdemeanors and because even misdemeanors I, was not being used in the same sense then as I mean, they don't mean like, you know, a D, uh, what, what's a misdemeanor? Jaywalking. Like jaywalking. Yeah. They didn't mean that. Did they? No. Yeah. Well, no. What do they mean when they said misdemeanors and other high crimes? So by high crime, they meant the sort of thing that can only be done by somebody who has a unique position of authority. So. So something that's that's political in nature, something that's done to circumvent justice. Um, they hmm. meant something something out of the ordinary. So so we think about misdemeanors these days as kind of run of the mill crimes. Right. So we mentioned jaywalking, but here when they're talking about high crimes, they're talking about the very most severe sort of crimes. Uh, committed by people with with a high level of political power, right? And the, and the notion of high means like against the state. So they they particularly had concerns of abuse of power in mind, didn't they? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And and also corruption because there's a separate clause in the Constitution that talks about this notion of emoluments. Yes. And do you want is it worth explaining that at this point? I mean, it's not necessarily relevant to this case, but yeah. So so the framers were really worried, right? They're writing the Constitution coming out of the Revolutionary War, where they felt like they had been really victimized by the British, and in particular by the king. And so while writing the Constitution, there are all kinds of provisions meant both 
to help assure the colonists that the the new federal government wasn't going to become too powerful, but also that the sort of people who would take political power in the United States would be the sort of people that wouldn't abuse it. And so impeachment is one of those. This emoluments clause is another, making sure that it's specifically prohibited for you to profit off of an office, holding office in the United States. Right. The idea, and, and I guess in my, I mean, it's come up in the context of impeaching Donald Trump in that there have been cases that have been brought about like Trump Tower and, and Mar-a-Lago and about whether or not the president is profiting from foreign countries there. But, but the essence of emoluments too is that they were concerned about corruption. Is that accurate to say? Yeah, absolutely. They, they were worried because, you know, when in the lead up to the revolution, there were, there were all kinds of, of British officers that they felt were just behaving in, in ways that were very corrupt. Yeah. And coming out of the Articles of Confederation, where you had a whole nother set of problems, they thought, OK, this Constitution is, is finally our opportunity to, to get a set of laws that can really tamp down on this and, yeah. and make it clear and easy. Yeah. And anti-corruption laws in general are based on the idea that corruption is bad for democracy because you don't know if somebody you elected is acting on their personal behalf or, in the, or for the benefit of the country. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're big fans of the Federalist Papers here. We try to sneak them in whenever whenever we possibly can. Uh, did the framers talk about what they were up to with the impeachment clause in the Federalist Papers? They did. That's a leading question. Yes, they yeah. did. So Hamilton, uh, our, our good friend Alexander Hamilton, talked about it in Federalist 65. In general, Hamilton talked a lot about the executive branch. Yes. Isn't that right? Yep. Yes. And so in the Federalist Papers, he's saying that impeachable crimes – are those things that proceed from the misconduct of public men or, in other words, from the abuse or violation of some public trust. And he goes on to say, they're of a nature which may be with peculiar propriety be denominated political as they relate chiefly to injuries done immediately to the society itself. Yeah. So, I mean, I read that as them saying uh, they weren't necessarily focused on criminal activity so much as they were focused on a particular type of dangerous political activity. Is, yeah. Is that fair to say? I think so. I, th- I think it goes back to this idea that they were really worried about abuse of power. Right. And so yeah. the I mean, the whole Constitution is built around an idea of 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 uh, <laughs> dissipating power. Right. Yes. It, 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 not allowing power to be concentrated. I'm sorry, it's not thinking. Not allowing power to be concentrated because they were concerned about abuses of power. Yeah, and and here they're saying, you know, in particular, if we feel like there is an abuse of power, we have a way to censure this person. So that's that's trying them, and then we have a way to remove them from office. Uh, but Hamilton looked ahead to our political moment. Uh, and and talked a little bit about political parties and partisanship. So, of course, when they wrote the Federalist Papers, there weren't formal political parties. And for some reason, they didn't seem to anticipate them. Yeah. Except they, at times when they talk about them here, like where Hamilton was thinking about it, but the Constitution didn't really anticipate parties. No. And in, and in fact, when, when Washington left office, he gives this great speech where he says, don't have political parties. Bad things will happen to democracy. Uh, and and so here in, in but in, whoever listens to these presidential farewell addresses, right? no one. Eisenhower had warnings too, but right, yeah. exactly. Uh, so so Hamilton goes on to say in in Federalist sixty five that he worries that the impeachment process will be decided quote more by the competitive strength of the parties than by real demonstrations of innocence or guilt. Yeah. So I, I want to get a little more into that, but just to stick with this for one yeah. second, I, there are a couple of points here I think are important. One is, I mean, in terms of understanding some of the rhetoric around the current moment, uh, not all crimes are necessarily impeachable. And you can be impeached for things that aren't necessarily a crime. Yes. They kind of anticipated that. And the fact that impeachment is being sort of derided as this sort of partisan activity, they would probably say, yeah, right. We knew that was going to happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think they 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 knew that this was something that should be used rarely, but but when it was used, it should it should be in response to something that uh, leads to or that's involving corruption or some kind of quote high crime against the yep. 
the the state. And and the nature that it's political too suggests to me that there also has to be an element in an impeachment proceeding of building political support. Absolutely. Right? It's not just about revealing the truth or the legality of something that happened, but but it, it's a political enterprise. I mean, part of what the what part of what the the House will need to do is to build support for this case that a democratically elected president should be removed. Yeah. So, you know, if you contrast this with something in the criminal law, like like murder, right? With a murder, you often need to show that, you know, somebody actually committed it, that it was premeditated, premeditated. There are clear things that need to be shown and those sh- those things need to be shown beyond a reasonable doubt. And if that happens, the jury is supposed to convict. Here, mm-hmm. we're left with this vague phrase, a high crime and misdemeanor, and it's up to Congress because what that is is inherently political to convince the public that they should use the political power that they get through the electoral process to, sh- to sanction the president. Yeah. So it's like a hybrid, actually, of legislative and judicial power, right? Because, I mean, in some ways, it's structured like a judicial proceeding where the House plays the role of a prosecutor and brings an indictment. That yes. Right? And in its original formulation, I believe the they would then take the case to the Supreme Court. Yes. And yeah. that didn't make it through like at the very last minutes, I think, of the Constitutional Convention. Is that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, I think they, they decided the Senate would be a, a better place for it to go. But they still gave the Supreme Court some element by making sure that when the president is impeached, uh, at least the chief justice has to walk across the street and and preside. Yeah, I want to I want to I'm going to pick that up in a second, but I just want to b- back up for one second and talk a little bit about how this power of impeachment that 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 the Congress has fits into the overall separation of powers. Yeah. So when when the framers were devising the constitutional structure, they were really concerned, like you said earlier, about diffusing power. So that, that was the word I was looking for. So that yeah. no <laughs> one branch of government can can get too powerful, right? So the president has the opportunity to veto legislation. The the legislative branch can override that veto. And so that same that same logic is in place here. And it's one of the rare things where all three branches of government are involved, right? Oh, that's a good point. I never The, yeah. the mm. president is involved because he or she is being impeached. Both the House and Senate are being involved because the House has to first formally impeach, or to use your, your language, they're, they're, they're bringing an indictment like a prosecutor. And then the Senate sits in judgment. They act like a jury. They're, they're fact-finding uh, and deciding whether or not the president should be removed from office. But that trial is presided over by the, by the chief justice of the Supreme Court. So you have the judicial branch presiding over uh, a proceeding in the legislative branch, which is constitutionally really rare, over whether or not someone from the executive branch should be removed from office. Yeah, well, that's, that's I never really thought about it that way. I mean, I, I always... I always teach the impeachment mm-hmm. power as being kind of the final showdown power. Yep. Uh, that it speaks to the, you know, in the minds of the framer, Article One is to Congress. That pride of place in the Constitution goes to the Congress. That they that they always saw the Congress as the most important and potentially powerful branch. Yes. That's why they cut it in two. Yep. Right. At least that's one one way to understand their decision to cut it in two. Uh, but that uh, they get the final showdown power because they can impeach either members. They can impeach members of the court. Yes. And they can impeach members of the, of the executive branch as yes. well. So they have that final that final power. Right. And this and this came up in uh, in recent weeks with the new reporting about Brett Kavanaugh. There was a, a brief kerfluffle. Oh, yeah. Where impeaching everyone them. was was talking about whether or not. You could impeach a Supreme Court justice. And of course, constitutionally, you can. Um, but practically, it has the same sorts of hurdles you you would go through with with a president. Even uglier, I would think. Ex- yes. I mean, it's more love for Kavanaugh, I think, on the Republican Party than, than there may be for Trump. But I guess we're going to see. Yeah. Uh, so the House decides to impeach. They have to bring it over to the Senate. Uh, is the Senate required to hold this trial? I mean, I... I would have thought so, but then we have Judge Garland 
floating around out there not being a Supreme Court justice because uh, even though I think we always thought that the Senate has to bring up for confirmation and nomination from the executive branch, they really don't. Yeah. So do they have to hold the trial? So we don't really know. Yeah, we really don't, do we? So the the language in the Constitution is that the Senate has the sole power to try impeachments. So the the Constitution clearly says that nobody else can, can do, do it. it. Right. But it doesn't say they have to do it. Um, the rules of the Senate are, of course, adopted by a majority of the Senate. So the way they're written now makes it seem like uh, they probably would, but they can change those. So so that's right. entirely at their own discretion. And we haven't had enough other presidential impeachments make it to that period, let alone make it to that stage where there's a really strong body of judicial precedent or anything. And even if the courts ruled on it, uh, it's hard for them to force Congress to do anything. And I, I would imagine they'd be reluctant to because it's so clearly a political question. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, the the Senate majority leader has a significant amount of control over the floor of what goes to the Senate. Absolutely. Right. Maybe not as much as a Speaker of the House does, but they have a lot of control over what goes to the floor of the Senate. So as I understand that, it's not only that McConnell has the decision about whether or not to bring articles to the floor. He can structure the entire proceeding. Yes. We could do this in an hour. Yeah. So the, you know, the, again, the language in the Constitution is that yeah. they have the sole power to try. And if they try it, we know that the, the chief justice has to preside. But there's nothing in the Constitution about what this trial looks like. You know, does it, does it have to look like a formal judicial proceeding where witnesses are called? They can do what they want. Yeah. Well, actually, I think they, if I remember correctly from, from the Clinton, yeah. th they did decide which witnesses would or would not be right. able to appear. And uh, I, I believe that even the chief justice's rulings might be up for floor vote. Do you yeah. know? I mean, if what kind of ruling would, it, would, it, would a chief justice make in the context of, a, of an impeachment hearing? Anyway? Well, so, yeah, so that's, you know, in a, in a trial proceeding, a, the, the presiding judge rules on things like whether or not evidence is admissible, whether it's hearsay, whether it's relevance. Uh, but all of those things are kind of out of the bounds in, a, in an impeachment setting because you can't tell constitutionally elected senators what they can and cannot consider right. as they're deciding a political question. You know, it's not, it's not like you're back in a murder trial where you have an eyewitness testifying to something they saw and, and there's a question about whether or not that's admissible or not. Um, it, it seems like the chief justice's role is much more ceremonial. Yeah, yeah. And so we shouldn't be surprised. I mean, Hamilton anticipated this, that McConnell's rulings and McConnell's reasoning in this is going to be very political. He's going to be thinking about a Senate majority. He's going to be thinking, how do I get through this affair in a way that preserves it? Or am I being too cynical? No, I, I think it, you know, it's it's funny in a sense, because for both of these two people, Mitch McConnell and, and John Roberts, this tees up the two things that they're both kind of well known for in the public eye, which is that uh, uh, Mitch McConnell is is publicly perceived as being very concerned about partisan power in the Senate and the ability to determine how a co-partisan president is being tried in the Senate is like the height of that. Yeah. And the thing that that people perceive about Roberts is that he's very concerned about the court's role vis-a-vis -vis the separation of powers. And here he, literally him, not even his whole court, he will be thrust right. potentially into the middle of this uh, and and having to to d make a bunch of rulings. Yes. Yeah. And, and from McConnell's perspective, he has quite a few senators up for reelection who are coming out of states that were either lost by Donald Trump or where his approval ratings are underwater who could potentially have to vote. Yes. On this. And I would imagine he's thinking, how do I protect Susan Collins? How do I protect Cory Gardner? How do I protect uh, Mc, McSally out in Arizona? Some people like that. Right. So so he's he, he has to think about individual senators in order to, to hold the Senate post 2020. 
and also has to think more broadly about the Republican Party. You right. know, r- removing a, a co-partisan president would be such an enormous action for a political party to take that it would have just enormous consequences. Yeah, and we tend to get very static in our thinking about the politics of this, like, oh, you know, the Republicans are all going to support Trump. Or, but we don't really know where this is going to be several weeks down the line. It all depends on what comes out. And, you know, as we've seen this week, things can change fast when you yes. get into this kind of this kind of political event. Yes. And, and you know, part of what the House's responsibility is going to be over the next few weeks is engaging in fact-finding as part of this campaign to educate and sway the views of the American people about what they should do. Yeah. So, you know, I've been struck over since the Democrats took over the House and have tried to do various sorts of oversight, how effective uh, the Trump administration has been at denying them witnesses, at denying them materials, at ignoring subpoenas, at courts kind of not moving all of that quickly. Uh, is there any reason to think that they're just going to be able to get Rudy Giuliani, for example, on the witness stand, or is it not going to be that easy? I mean, I was let me, let me just add one yeah. thing. I mean, I was really struck, given this kind of policy since the 2018 election of giving the House nothing, that the transcript came out within, what, 48 hours and uh, maybe even less, of, of and, and, and they just gave it over. Right. They just gave it over. So one thing one thing we don't know yet is how the House is going to structure their investigation. So right. when this has happened before, the House has, has formally voted as the House to open an impeachment investigation. And, and that's not what happened. Nancy Pelosi made this announcement, right? Yes. But she didn't put anything on the floor. Right. Yeah. And when they have done that in the past, they have, in that resolution, armed their committees – with increased subpoena power and more power. Since the the last impeachment, the political party of com- political power of, of committees in Congress has increased such that just the normal run of the mill committee now has the power that they didn't, that have, they didn't have before. In other words, in the past, I think that if they wanted to issue a subpoena, it had to go to the House floor. Yes. Now a committee can issue a subpoena. Absolutely. Yeah. Which they can then ignore seems to be what's been happening. But once I, I think the thinking has been, isn't it, that once there's an impeachment proceeding that they're on stronger legal grounds and pushing yeah. their subpoenas? So so several judges over the last year or so have said, well, you know, maybe this subpoena you don't really have to comply because they're just using their normal oversight powers. But if this was an impeachment investigation, things would be different. And so now we're in an impeachment investigation and so I guess we'll find out uh, the extent to which uh, people will have to be forced to comply. Yeah. I mean, it was striking, wasn't it? I mean, Pelosi comes out and it's like, bam, everything seemed to change. Yes. Even though it really didn't change anything. But it did seem to me that it reflected a, a kind of tipping point where the Democratic Party became unified behind them. And I mean, people, you know, when, when you think about what the what a leader in the House does, what an effective leader does is they kind of know where they're caucus or conference is. And they're sort of, I hate to use the phrase leading from behind, but I mean, they're paying attention to where their caucus is and they're out in front for them. Right. They don't want to get too far out in front. She felt something shifted. Yes. And, you know, this, I think, helps to kind of illustrate the the difference between impeachment for like run of the mill crime versus impeachment for high crimes and misdemeanors. misdemeanors. Yeah. Where you know there were there were lots of individual members of the house who were making the argument a year or more ago that that the president should be impeached for Russia or for emoluments or for any number of things and that was some minority of the house caucus and they were putting mostly pressure. from safer seats yes mostly from safer seats yeah and they were putting pressure on Pelosi to bring an impeachment investigation, and she resisted that. And then over the last week, we saw the House uh, Democrats really consolidate, and then that's when when Nancy Pelosi came out and, and announced the investigation. Yeah. So let's, let's talk a bit, because I think it really is quite important, especially for 
for our focus on democracy, to talk about why we're concerned about what happened in Ukraine in the first place. Yeah. I mean, why what happened there? I mean, part, part of how I think about the whole Ukraine thing is it's a much simpler story for people to understand. And it also, in a way, connects back to so many of the other concerns that people have raised about, about Trump, both in Russia and corruption and this and that. But there's a sort of simplicity to the story that helps. But, you know, let, let's talk a little bit. What are the concerns here about Ukraine that rise to the issues of high crimes? So I think one, one issue is the question of, of foreign affairs. And the, the president has more leeway to act unilaterally in foreign affairs than, than any other branch of government. It's, it's in the Constitution that he's the person or she's the person that meets with ambassadors when they come to the United States. And there's this sense that the president is supposed to be the U.S.'s person in foreign affairs. And so when it comes out, to go back to our earlier discussion of, of worries about people working for their own gain rather than the national gain, that uh, in these private conversations with foreign leaders that could be happening, that's the sort of thing that that might flip the switch for people who, who weren't sure before. Yeah. I have a couple other things that it raises in my mind, too. I mean, one is it's a sort of classic abuse of power. Yes. If the president is using his position to try to get a foreign government to help his political campaign. Yes. And, you know, one thing that struck me about the phone call, about the transcript is – he didn't really talk about anything else. Right. <laughs> that was basically the purpose of the phone call was whether there was a quid to the quo or not is actually not relevant. There's a sort of at least such as the charge that there's a kind of abuse of power here in strong arming the president of Ukraine to investigate investigate uh, the vi former vice president. Yeah. And, and I think one thing and this gets back to what you were saying about a short narrative it's it's in some sense almost surprising that the transcript was publicly released so early yeah because it's so short and it's so easy to read that you know people who otherwise might not pay attention to politics or they might not be sure you know in the internet age you can go on the internet you can read it for yourself and you know the language that the president was using uh, in terms of you know the US has done all these things for Ukraine but Ukraine hasn't done that much for the U.S., I think, like you were saying, is, is simple enough that even people who don't pay any attention to politics can read that and and wonder. Yeah, Al although, you know, the, the White House is denying that. I mean, yes. their thinking in releasing the transcript was, this is going to help us. Right. And, you know, I was watching a little bit of Kellyanne Conway the other day, and, I mean, she's basically saying – which we've heard before, what you're seeing is not what you're seeing. Right. It, it's really something else. But I think there are other issues, too. And that is what the, the two that really remind me of, of President Nixon, actually. One is it's always the cover up. Yeah. Uh, because the cover up suggests a sort of knowledge that mm -hmm. you're doing something wrong. Otherwise, you don't cover it up. And so this information that they may have stuck this transcript onto this. A uh, server, and there's a server. Right. Who would have guessed, right? <laughs> that that they put it onto this server that's supposed to be reserved for the highest level, right? Covert intelligence activities. Uh, so that's a problem because cover-ups. I mean, cover-ups raise concerns about rule of law, mm -hmm. about transparency, uh, and then I also thought. There could be potential witness intimidation in here, too, which also plays into obstruction of justice because he was talking about the people who spoke to the whistleblower who presumably will be witnesses right. before the House Intelligence Committee. And I think he called them spies and suggested yeah. we should do with them like what we did in the olden days. What did, what did we do with spies? How many spies have we hung? I don't know. It's yeah. certainly not one for a long time. Yeah, and it's certainly it's going back a while. So there are, and and I mean, part of what I think makes this makes this impeachment case in Pelosi's eyes so strong is how well this attaches. This sort of connects with the Mueller report without having to rely on the Mueller report. Right? The Mueller report identifies six or eight cases of obstruction of justice, and here you go again. Right. And and, and I think it's it's easier for our, for the House. Because they can start the investigation from square one. 
So with the Russia, yeah, with the like Russia investigation, yeah, yeah, you know, things were happening. There were things happening in the special counsel. Can we get the information from the special counsel? We have to explain all this stuff. And with with Ukraine, they get first dibs at investigating and explaining. And any time in politics, you can be the first person to explain something. Uh, is, yeah, is yeah, generally good for you. That's a neat point. And then the other thing I was going to say from the from Nixon, one of the Nixon articles of uh, impeachment was uh, their refusal to to abide by duly authorized subpoenas. Mm-hmm. I mean, basically refusing to cooperate with Congress in the proceeding. And, you know, it was kind of interesting. I mean, we saw this with Lewandowski yep. last week and uh, – and, and and I heard members of the House Judiciary Committee talk about that in the context of, oh, well, you just watched the commitment of a impeachable offense, essentially, because the House is – because he's asserting a privilege from the White House that doesn't exist. Right. Uh, but now here, so far, he's cooperated. But going forward, we'll, 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 certainly we're going to see what happens. Like when it comes to the, to the big players in this, right, the, Giuliani and uh, the attorney general and then the one who I think – you know, a good impeachment case needs a good witness. Yep. And in my uh, in my view, the one that they really want is Bolton. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Because um, he was there for everything. Yep. He is a Russia hawk. So withholding defense mu- funds to the Ukraine must have been driving him crazy. Yeah. All right. I think it's time to wrap it up. That was fun. Yeah, it was. Yeah, that was good. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. And... I've been here with uh, Michael Nelson from uh, my colleague in political science. I'm Michael Berkman, and this has been Democracy Works. 